Hello and welcome to England Cricket on 99.94 Cricket Every Day. I'm Daniel Norcross, um, commentator, broadcaster, occasional writer, webbler, podca- podcaster. Poncho and wearer. Poncho wearer, still, still got the poncho on. Um, <laughs> it'll be the last few days of the poncho before I head out to South Africa for warmer climbs, although the weather forecast is for it to be really sunny until the first day of the Women's World Cup, then it'll start <laughs> raining. So, oh, whoa, what a surprise. And... <laughs> interjecting, as he often does. He is the great man, the puff pastry hangman himself. He is about to go to New Zealand. It's chief cricket writer for the Press Association, Rory Dollard. Today, we are going to be looking at, in some detail, the announcement of England's white ball squads. We've got an ODI squad and a T20 squad for the Tour of Bangladesh. Three matches in each format being played from the very beginning of March, virtually overlapping with the Test squad. So there are some compromises to be made there. And... Just before we head off and before Rory heads off on his 39-hour flight, or whatever it is, <laughs> we will run the rule over very briefly. The three-match one-day series ended in South Africa the other day with a resounding six-wicket performance from the mighty, sort of gobsmackingly delicious Joffre Archer. But let us begin. England Cricket on 99.94 is your new home for England Cricket content and we will be dropping into your podcast feed and on YouTube or the 99.94 app several times every week. So please rate, review and subscribe. Thank you for joining Cricket's Conversation. Rory, the news landed about five minutes before we were due to record this of the T20 and ODI scores to Bangladesh. And there are so many names of England cricketers in so many different formats, playing in so many different parts <laughs> of the world, that I, I couldn't retain it all. So I just saw the odd headline, like, there's no David Willey. And I thought, what what, what did he do that, wrong, particularly? <laughs> that was nobody's <laughs> headline. Come off it. <laughs> it was mine. It was mine. I was, because I go through and I go, wait a minute. I think I've seen every single name of every England cricketer who's alive in the <laughs> present day. Oh, there's Tom Abel. I wonder who'll be next. Tom Orsop. <laughs> <laughs> Run through them all alphabetically. But there was, and then as I ran through them alphabetically, I got to the bottom and there's no David Willey. That obviously isn't the major headline, but um, I guess let's let's go through that squad, Rory. What what does it what does it look like? Yeah, well, I mean, with Willey, first of all, I don't know if we're a little bit early recording here to find out. I don't know if he's if he's got an injury niggle that he picked up. Uh, or if it's just it's rotation or selection. But I suppose he'll be particularly mindful that we're approaching World Cup year. Uh, and David Willey's got a bit of experience with that. Um, so, Deja vu all yeah, over again. He'll, he'll, be hoping, uh, he'll be hoping for better news soon. The, the, so the squad, I mean, ODI-wise, Roy, that one century, has, has earned him his place. That That is it. He, he, he was one innings away from trouble. He blobbed out a couple of times, but that century showed that he had the fire in his belly and England England has sort of signed up and, and he's back. I suppose it's been covered and it's been uh, well reported, but the Alex Hales absence from the squad is an interesting element because this is a guy who spent three years in the wilderness, got his, got his recall, won the T20 World Cup with England and, and the narrative became, well, will he, will he come back to the 50 over team and, and sort of go for another World Cup there? Well, he's going to the PSL instead. That means no chance uh, of the ODIs and England have also now without him in the T20s. It kind of makes you wonder, it kind of makes you wonder what the, what the future is there, doesn't it? For, for Hills with, with Johnny Bairstow likely to come back. And for me, I kind of wonder, I don't know if you've ever had friends who've been in a relationship, broke it up, and then given it another go. And invariably when this happens, they decide they're the same people as they were when they broke up. They're on different journeys and they break up again. Well, I wonder if we're on that trajectory with Alex Sales. You know, yeah, I, it, it feels like that. I mean, we've got to be rounded and balanced about this. Um, I think I heard Nasser Hussain say yesterday on television that um, Alex Hale stood to 
make you know, to about £200,000 out of the PSL. And for playing in the ODIs, he might make about £20,000. Now, you can sort of see, therefore, why he would <laughs> choose the PSL. He's also of a certain age. Mm-hmm. Um, 50 over cricket might not be his bag. Now, not very many people play it. The England captain, Ben Stokes, has decided to junk 50 over cricket. Now, I know Alex Hales isn't playing red ball cricket either, but I think with the, with the landscape such as it is and with the precarity at the top of the order, um, you know, he's seen Jason Roy get a ton. He's seen Dawid Milan actually outbat Jason Roy in the three matches in South Africa with a half century and a cent- brilliant century in the third game. Absolutely stellar knock. With Johnny Bairstow liable to come back, with Phil Salt already in the side and the squad, you can kind of see why he would do that. Um, I just wonder what it means about him playing for England's T20 either. But I mean, there is well, another the World Cup. He's not in the T20 squad. He's not so, in the T20 squad either. So my my, the, my, my concern. I'm not. I don't want to make any like grandstanding soapbox moral judgments on Alex Hales. How dare you? You know, not not kiss the badge and all that because that's not the world ultimately that the cricket is in at the moment. It, there is a few more decisions to make. But what I do wonder is, is this just a, a question that these two, Alex Hales and England cricket team, are on different journeys and different paths and there's probably not a lot more left to run with it. Uh, rather than Alex Hales' World Cup win, with some very good performances in it, setting up the second, sort of the, the next chapter of his career, I wonder if it was like a little coda Mm. And it's sort of it's sort of wrapped, but it, it, it does ask some interesting questions. The the other thing, of course, with Alex Hales is that he he might say, "Well, I'm taking this PSL deal. I, I don't think I'm even going to be picked for the one day team." It's not as though it was PSL or World Cup. The World Cup was, as you suggested, a uh, maybe a long shot. So it is interesting. It's the same week that Tom Curran has gone red uh, white ball only. These questions, the questions of of how. Which parts of cricket dominate? Which parts of cricket have primacy? Will continue, and it's only going to get thornier and stickier as we go along. Uh, ain't that the case? Now then, um, let's dig a bit deeper into this. So the ODIs they begin on the first of March, the first, third, and sixth of March, and then the T Twenties begin on the ninth of March. So, for those of you scratching your heads trying to work out who's in what squad and why. We can make some things a little bit easier for you. The ODI squad contains none of the players who are in New Zealand playing the two Test Match series, which Rory's going to see. I can't remember the exact dates of, but they finish at the end of February, the two games, don't they? Yeah, basically, there is going to be a bit of overlap. Like The New Zealand tour will be coming to an end while the white ball team is on its way to Bangladesh. It's, It's a jigsaw that doesn't quite fit together. So, um, test players aren't in the ODI squad, but you can fit in some of that test squad into the T20s. Of course, there aren't very many people who would sort of qualify for that necessarily, but um, one of them staring me in the face is Will Jacks. So Mm. he gets to go to the the T20 leg of Bangladesh tour. For the one-day squad, you've got many of of the suspects that have been playing in the this current series not Ben Duckett because because he is now cemented this place in the test team um, so you've still got your opening batters Roy Milan there's no Duckett but James Vince has come back into the fold fascinating he'll be able to bat at three or in the top two presumably still no Joe Root because he's playing for the test side Tom Abel has come in which is quite the move mm-hmm. um, I want to get your thoughts on that in a moment Joss Butler will be there at sort of number five. You've got Moeen Ali still hanging around. You've still got Sam Curran. That's pretty similar to, to what we've just seen in South Africa. And then a bit of a change when it gets to the bowlers. So um, Chris Wokes is there. Yes, Joffrey Archer is there, but no Ollie Stone because he's, he's going to test squad. New Zealand. Mark Wood is in the ODI squad because regardless of his heroics in Pakistan, he's been rested from two test matches instead to play <laughs> in an OTI squad in Bangladesh. There's reasons for this. I don't 100% understand them. And first sighting in an OTI squad for Rehan Ahmed. We've also got the returning Saqib Mahmood after a back injury whose star was very much rising towards um, the beginning of England's last summer before he got his unfortunate injury. Reese Topley is uh, selected 
So there's a fair bit of continuity there. The big changes, I guess, Tom Abel, Rayan Ahmed, and Mark Wood coming in, um, all for very, very different reasons, and a returning Saki Mahmood. So what, what do you make of those? So it looks, it looks quite a lot like a World Cup squad, doesn't it? Root, Root is an obvious addition to that. Uh, and Bairstow, and, I guess, yeah. And Bairstow. So you look at it, maybe people like Tom Abel clearly isn't a lock because he's just appeared out of clear blue sky. So he's probably got a bit to do. Uh, Ryan Ahmed, it feels a bit early for him. I mean, it's not impossible because with the with the tournament being in India, it's not impossible. But again, he, it almost feels like he might appear in the next cycle and this is just an early part of his they development. Just, they, they want him to play as much cricket as possible, don't they? And you could see that by the way they, they were encouraging him, yeah. him to play the, the ILT20 and especially actually out in subcontinent pitches because, you know, made his debut in Pakistan. They're very happy for him to play in Dubai. They want him to play in Bangladesh. This is kind of part of a of a wider development, isn't it, for Rayan Ahmed? Yeah, yeah. They, they, they've been pretty... They're all over it, basically, with him, and they have been for quite a while. You know, long before he was making headlines, England have been into him and, and knowing where he's going. Uh, I mean, Vince... Vince has, has got a chance, and it's really good that they've gone back to him and not sort of drawn a line there, because he does keep performing. He's a really... He's a really quite reliable performer at, at the level just below, uh, and he has a chance. But again, when you start to factor in people like Liam Livingston, Joe Root, he's 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 got a bit to do to sort of lock down a place. Uh, and also, and then, just just quickly before we move on from that, the the place where he's probably made most of his uh, headlines recently has been in T Twenty and especially out in the Big Bash, and he's in the ODI squad. But then I forgot to mention, of course, Ben Duckett as well as Will yeah. Jacks come over for T20 so goodbye James thank you very much played your three games you've had 10 days in Bangladesh you can toddle off now yeah it's it it is it's unsatisfactory to some extent I suppose for for these people and you got the impression with with James Vince last summer that he kind of was beginning to accept that he was going to have to take his caps where they were on offer and maybe he wasn't at the top table so he's a you know he's a, he's a solid performer but England England selectors do have a job to do at the moment. This, you know, bear in mind that Bangladesh tour is the sixth touring leg of the winter. And there's a pretty big summer coming up. So Is that right? Is that right? That's the sixth. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Two two separate trips to, to Pakistan. Australia World Cup in the middle of it. Then South Africa, New Zealand, Bangladesh. Six legs of touring yeah. this winter. So if you turn up and put your TV on and your favourite England player isn't playing, there's a reason. It's probably somewhere else about yeah. to play for England yeah. exactly. <laughs> in a different format. <laughs> okay, well, look, we're going to take a break there. When we come back after the break, we're going to keep on going because there's more, there's more juiciness in these squads. You're listening to Cricket's Conversation on 99.94. Whatever your team, we have the show for you on podcast, YouTube or On the 99.94 app, we have India, England, South Africa, West Indies, and now Sri Lanka covered. If you want to find us, the best way is to follow us on social media at 9994DM by downloading the 9994 app or Google 99.94 on podcast. We speak cricket. Welcome back. Um, So just for the break, we were looking at the England ODI and T20 squads for Bangladesh. Uh, Mark Wood, this intrigues me that Mark Wood, there's a test series going on and actually England lack a a lot of pace in that test squad out in New Zealand. And they were sort of playing uh, Mark Wood quite extensively out in Pakistan on pitches that you wouldn't have said particularly suited him and then he held up up pretty well. Um, Is this about just managing workload? Are they spooked a bit, perhaps, by what happened to Joffrey Archer when England went to New Zealand not that long ago and they ended up with a with a broken man? Is there something of that sort going on? I can't quite fathom the reasoning. I wouldn't at all be surprised if if they're taking a view there. Yeah, you know, this is the this is the place where Joffrey Archer bowled forty two overs <laughs> and uh, came away very dischuffed with a body that was made out of hula hoops. Um, so, so Wood, Wood is 
just as important as Archer. Archer is such an exciting guy and, and we all know, but don't sleep on Mark Wood. He is super important for the Ashes and the Ashes is top spot for this summer. It really is. And this year, in fact, it's, it's more important to English cricket than the 50 over World Cup. It, they need to get that right. So they're probably just parceling out their options, but taking Mark Wood to New Zealand where pitches have been unhelpful and sometimes flat boring, frankly, in, in times gone by, it's probably a fairly sensible decision. You've got Broad and Anderson ready to do their thing. The way they're setting up that bowling attack, it's like they are digging in for some hard work because they've got Broad and Anderson. Matthew Potts is back. Potts runs in, charges in, bangs it, bangs it, bangs it, ready to go. He's champing at the bit, frankly, to get going. So he's ready to do that work. Ollie Robinson, newly found Jim Bunny from last year, ready to go. It, it just looks like the way they've set that team up is to, to be ready to bowl a lot. And, and Mark you Wood know, shouldn't be bowling a lot before the Ashes. No, I, 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 I get that. But, you know, England would have played against Pakistan and New Zealand in test matches, which can be two of the most unforgiving places for, for bowling generally, but certainly for quick bowling. And yet, Stokes was very clear in how he used pace in Pakistan. And it was really necessary. I mean, Wood made some really important um, interventions with that pace. So is he going to be a bit lacking in that two-test series? Because there's not, there isn't a lot of pace there. Anderson, Broad, Robinson, Potts is a bit brisker. I'll give you that. But, you know, there's not a lot of oomph out and out pace. So um, I'm just wondering if, you know, why in Pakistan, which is probably the most unforgiving place for a bowler to bowl, that they've gone in, they've taken wood there. But in New Zealand, which might be an unforgiving place, but actually can also be a little bit lively, especially uh, in, in a summer like the one they've had, that they've left him out. Just trying to weigh that up. I don't hate the idea. I, 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 I was very clear after the last Ashes and and Wood performing so well in Hobart, throughout the whole series actually, but in Hobart particularly, I thought it was a clear objective that they should be targeting times when they wanted Mark Wood to be firing. And actually, if, if England did really pick Pakistan as a target, as a sort of big thing, then fair play to them because it is, that was a huge series in the context of going back to Pakistan the crowds, the, the status of that series, that was a big series. So fair play for them for recognising that. This New Zealand series isn't World Test Championship as far as I'm, I don't think it is. Again, what is it about yeah. New Zealand that we never play them in the World Test Championship? <laughs> I know. So if they're taking that view, I think that's fair enough. Matthew Potts is ready to get an England shirt on again. I think it's sensible management, really. Um, the fact that Jax is out there is interesting because... He's someone maybe you thought they wouldn't find a place for him in, in the way they're going to balance the team out. But maybe that's a way they do things differently. And also, if Ben Stokes finds himself short of a little bit of pace, he'll just try and score at nine and over instead. Uh, well, and and, and do, do, buy do some know, time in the I, game that way. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I might have thought you were exaggerating about six months ago, but I'm not sure that you are. I, I, I think with Will Jacks, there's something else going on, you know. I think they are... In, really, really impressed by his brain as much as anything else. Mm. And they see a kind of longer term um, slot for Will Jax as a, as a skipper. I know that sounds an incredible thing to say about mm. a guy who's only just come into the side and barely into the side at that. But I think this is a longer term commitment to Will Jax as part of an, an England establishment. You know, He's got all of those attributes that a lot of young players have in England, like, you know, like the Will Smeeds of this world and looking to smash it all over the place. But I think he actually wants something more out of cricket. I think he wants like a management role, a captaincy mm. role. And I think they see a, a long-term future. Uh, Will Jax has been part of the cricketing establishment. Now, he doesn't yet have the experience in red ball cricket. He's not good enough spin bowler. And he's frankly not yet a good enough test match middle order batter. But I think they can see that he's got the brain to develop into that. And that's why he's one of just a couple of players who they're perfectly happy to have in two test matches in New Zealand mm. and then fly him all the way over to Bangladesh. 
play three T20s. Um, it's almost like, you know, that they're, they're just having a look to see what what he'll cavil against and what he'll embrace and well, how much of a of a bloke he really is. And, well, that's, uh, that, is, that is interesting though, because actually when Stokes took the captaincy and when they were looking at who might, or when we were looking at who might be his vice captain, you were looking, you were looking at the generation down. You weren't necessarily thinking it should have been one of his contemporaries. And you're thinking, who, you know, who, who maybe might be part of that succession planning. And actually you looked and you thought, Ollie Pope doesn't, he almost has those Ian Bell vibes whereby he, he played 100 does, tests and was he, never the captain. And I mean, really we, know does, that, yeah. we know that he is, as a player, we know that's kind of a cliche, but it, that, that cliche extends quite a long way that he doesn't, you wouldn't be surprised if Ollie Pope plays 115 tests and never captains England. <laughs> it seems, yeah. you know, oh, Zach, well, Crawley, Zach Crawley was a, considered to be an option, but that's, it feels a bit of a, of a, of a reach at the moment because he needs to be a little more settled. I mean, Dan Lawrence has personality, but I don't know if it is, I'm not sure about that one. So yeah, if Will Jacks emerges as the young person who might have a bit of, a bit of leadership or a bit of magnetism about them, then there's a, there's a spot to fill there for sure. Um, now, Saki Mahmood, I want to come on to, because I think really that the batting is what it is, but the two interesting uh, bits left in those squads for me, uh, with Chris Jordan returning, we should point out. So he's won a World Cup, but he's not been jettisoned. He's not been the sort of Liam Plunkett of the second World Cup winning campaign. He's he's mm-hmm. still going to be around. Uh, but Saki Mahmood and David Willey, now, um, you, you mocked me for being surprised at uh, David Willey's omission. Sam Curran is there as a left arm all rounder, and he's ahead of David Willey, you'd have to say at the moment. And I just got thinking about David Willey, and I know you're going to mock me even more now. You wake <laughs> up in the morning and you spend your time thinking about David Willey. But yeah. David Willey in this stellar England white ball lineup is there or thereabouts. He's played a lot of games. Mm. I was looking at England's leading wicket takers in ODI formats last night. Again, you know, sort of thing that you do. Can't and he's that. up there, he's, he's prominent, and yet. I don't see him getting picked up by the big franchises. I don't see a big tag on him. I don't see lots of money on him. Um, he's I mean, essentially very, I don't know, unlucky, but very prominent cricketer. He's a prominent cricketer that people forget. And he's been overlooked here. As we say, you don't know whether he's, he's carrying an injury or, or some such. So we've got to be mindful of that. But it was a surprise and sort of not a surprise at the same time when I saw the squad. I thought, well, well you know, he only played the one game, didn't he, in South Africa? They want to get Saki Mahmood back because they're very excited by his potential, um, his variations especially, but also as a battery, one of a battery of bowlers for a very demanding England summer that begins in June. So, you know, where where do you stand on on those two? Willie, I think all that stands. I think he, when he was left out of the 19 squad for the incoming Archer, I think the easiest thing in the world would have been for that to be the end of his England career because he has been over the years, uh, I speaks his mind, can be combustible. I think there was probably some expectation that he might rail against that decision and burn his bridges. He's, he, was, he took that very maturely, at least in public. I spoke to him a few months after, six months after, and he was measured and calm and didn't want to burn anyone because he thought there might just be a chance that he could get back in. And in that period, since the 19 World Cup, he's played a lot of cricket for England. Keeps turning up, doing his thing. I think the thing that he does might just be edged out again because Topley has bowled so well as a left armour. Curran has become the rising man and, and actually Willie's low order hitting was one of his selling points. Curran eats a bit of his breakfast there. So it could be a case of history repeating itself with Willie. He could find himself nudged out of the final equation and, and India might not be the perfect place. Now, the thing about Willie is you get balls that swing and you get balls that don't swing. Sometimes he turns up and it, and it hoops. Sometimes you turn up and it's dead straight. He's the guy who swings the one that doesn't swing. He always seems to get a bit of juice out of it. But in India, I'm just not sure. I'm just not sure that that his skills 
over 10 overs are quite what they're looking for. Maybe they, they, they might just err uh, to someone with a slightly different profile. And the, the batting isn't strong enough, is it, for him to be a sort of Stokes equivalent where you might no. get four or five overs out of him and, and all of those yeah. with a new ball up top and then his yeah. batting being sufficiently reliable down the order. So I, I, I think I, I concur with all of that. Before we go to our last break, though, quickly, Saki Mahmood, yeah. um, delighted at his return. Yeah, he's he's a really exciting cricketer. I think sometimes performances that happen overseas get valued or weighed slightly less than when it's happened in the English summer. His test match in Barbados, he bowled he he bowled fantastically well, really, on a fairly crap pitch. And at the time when England, this was the Red Ball reset. This was Red Ball reset era before Brendan McCullum arrived. Uh, he was almost. The, the 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 hook that we were hanging our hopes on post Ashes debacle. It was like, wow, we got this fast bowler. He zips in. He got a bit of mongrel in him. Got a bit of fight. Uh, overperformed with the bat in Grenada as well. You know, showed a bit of determination and grit. I think he got his first class, his best first class score in his second Test match. But so he 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 has showed that in a very very small sample size that that international cricket might be for him. And this strikes me as just England recognising that and saying, this is our first opportunity to get the guy back through the front door. So more Saki mm. Mahmood is always a good thing. Well, um, it's amazing, isn't it? It was a year ago that Red Bull reset. It didn't work. And Matthew <laughs> Fisher was playing for England at that point. And he's been playing again. He's been playing for the Lions. He picked up Pfeiffer in the Lions test match against Sri Lanka. I tell you, there are so many England players. <laughs> players who've got test caps. They're all over the place at the moment. Um, in a good way. It's time for our final break. After that, we are very quickly going to run the rule over the end of England's ODI tour to South Africa. If you love the language of cricket and want more, then head over to the 99.94 app and you can hear all of our podcasts and cricket commentary. We're adding new shows all the time and covering cricket series from all over the world. Be the first to hear all of our announcements by following us on social media at 9994DM. Welcome to Cricket's Conversation. Welcome back. Well, um, I don't know whether this is rose-tinted spectacles. I don't think it is because I think I mentioned this the last time we spoke. I, I felt that England were very unlucky to be 2-0 down. I thought they were rusty after the in the first game when they dominated the match. Actually, were in control of it for 75% of it. I thought they were unlucky to lose a toss on a very challenging pitch in the second game, yet somehow got to 342. The pitch looked flat as anything after that, and uh, South Africa did very well, it must be said, to get to that target. But yesterday, history repeated itself with England being forced to bat in conditions, which I watched the first 20 overs, and the ball was just popping off mm-hmm. a length. It was impossible. When, when Joss Butler doesn't get a run off his first 13 balls... <laughs> When Dawid Milan had something like four off 18 at the top. Um, Jason Roy had popped one up. The uh, ball had flown through off Ben Duckett. Out, by the way, in identical fashion to how he was in the second game. So you never know. Maybe Simon Hughes is onto something. But um, to have recovered from that with one of the most remarkable partnerships in English ODI history between Milan and Joss Butler, that is no exaggeration. The highest one ever against South Africa for an England pairing. Both of them made centuries. And yet, despite what was a masterclass in 50-over batting from two very experienced guys, one who has basically claimed possibly to be England's greatest white ball player, we're all talking about Joffre because, because we know that Joss can do that. And we sort of knew that Dawood Milan could do that, hugely underrated player. Mm. But it's what we imagine Joffre Archer might do, which is what's got everybody's tongues wagging. And a couple of those wickets were quite cheap, but they'll happen in white ball cricket. He probed and probed on off stump, and as that pitcher got flatter and flatter, and it was harder for anybody else to get a wicket. Mm. And South Africa were hunting down that target. Looked like they might well get it. Whenever Joss Butler needed a wicket, he turned to Joffre, who smilingly, off 10 paces, <laughs> ambled in to bowl medium pace, and then whacked Aidan Markram on the shoulder first ball. Mm. And... We were all licking our lips and we were all instantly imagining what he might do to Marnus Labashain at Lords. <laughs> and, and so it goes on, the romance of cricket, Rory. 
Yeah, this is great. You know, we, we, we were just glad to see Joffrey Archer back in that first game playing. And, and honestly, people gave him a right good rap for turning up and bowling and going at seven and over or whatever it was. So to see him immediately after, just, you know, one game to settle in, get a big hat full of wickets, hit people, do his, do his little variations of pace, nip it around. It just, it did, it got you, it got you thinking about where next and remembering that this guy electrified, electrified cricket fans in the summer of 2019 made us have ambition and hope and optimism. <laughs> and th- these are the, these are the currency of sport, aren't they? So it, it is, it is great. And actually the fact that he can turn up and ball like that and become the big talking point and the big show of the day. That's a, that's a, a strike for bowlers because how many times does a mm. bowler basically set up a match and one of the lads in the top three reels off 75, 80 player of the match. Thank you very much. Where's my check? <laughs> it happens all the yeah. time. So for a fast bowler to rock up and, uh, and sort of blow away to outstanding, outstanding centuries and become the talking point. That's a little bit of balance on the weighing scales. Bowlers need a bit of love sometimes. I, I, I do think it was the most extraordinary partnership I've witnessed because I saw how hard it was for everybody to bat in the first, well, 25, 30 overs. The pitch did not get easier for a while and it was clearly quite tacky, quite moist to start with. Once the sun beat down after two hours, it flattened out. But to be in still mm. is something. And that's where just the sheer experience of Butler. And you've got to say Milan. I mean, it's only his 15th ODI, yeah. but he looked... His third hundred. Third century, yeah. He looked for all the world like he'd been playing that format for years, which he has, of course, because he's an experienced yeah. <laughs> cricketer, but they play a lot less of it these days. But they, there was no desperate flail with, at 20 for three. Could easily have become 50 for six or worse. Uh, you fancy in the test side, actually, they would have tried to bash their way out yeah. of trouble. But actually... Um, those two we, were going at four and over after 25 overs. The last 20 overs, they went at over 10, mm. which is just quite staggering. The power hitting we know all about, but perhaps watching Milan actually go through the gears might remind some people that he isn't just somebody who chews up balls. When he's mm. in, he gives it a, a, wow, a sweet timer of the ball, especially mm. over wide, long on a deep mid-wicket. And um, just the last thought on on that, on the on the batting, I'd have to say that after the first game, Jason Roy was, as we know, filled with relief and everyone was delighted for him um, because of been a great servant of England cricket and we'd clearly been struggling. Gets that 100. But, you know, David Milan, he wasn't there to make up the numbers. He was there because he wants a slot in the opening berth. And, well, his 100 was better and he got a half century as well. And actually, I think, Jason Roy, regardless of the 100, might be a net negative after that because, you know, Bairstow comes back in. If he comes back in, are you dropping Milan, left-hander? I mean, a, a, a side like England are prone to getting themselves occasionally into awkward situations through over-aggression or just aggression, mm. I should say, at the top of the order, and they lose some wickets. In knockout cricket, that's fatal. It's all very well in, you know, a five-match bilateral series. You can just keep going and Mm. the odds are you'll win it. But you can't afford to be doing that in the semi-final. So does that raise Milan's stock above Roy? Well, they've both, you know, they've both landed a big one. So maybe Phil Salt is the loser. Maybe he's the one who, who pays for it a bit. But what I loved about the Milan innings was it was like, Sometimes bowlers talk about loving the hard work. Jimmy always talks about he loves it when he wakes up in the morning and he's stiff and he can't move because he knows he's earned it. He knows he's... And that was that was that innings for Milan. He had a face like bloody thunder for 20 overs. He looked like he was yeah. quite... He looked like the most disinterested uh, Aldi shop assistant who doesn't want to be on their shift, got a raging hangover. Do not, I don't want to be sacking the bread. I'm not interested, but I've got to. <laughs> and that's what my, that's what Malad looked like. He was having an awful scrap with the game and with his vocation. His career was not loving him back. 
but he likes that. He likes digging in and working hard and seeing what he can earn from it. And he cashed in big time. He's a really, he's a really fun guy to, to watch. He's very expressive uh, when he's batting. And he, <laughs> some of the facial expressions he was pulling at the start uh, were hilarious. But I actually think on the selection issue, I think it's a decision they can make pretty late because although he's only played 15 games, as you say, Milan is quite uh, quite a steady, safe pair of hands. If they want to plug him in quite late, they can plug him in and they'll get a pretty reliable performance out of him. It's not as though he needs a six-month promise. So Roy has certainly done enough to earn his spot in the Bangladesh squad. Uh, and, and that's now a decision that they can be left a little bit later because Milan's a pretty steady pair of hands. Right, it's going to be time for us to wrap up. Um, before we do, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, Rory flies off to New Zealand today. Remind us when when are those two test matches? Have you got the have you got the dates in your head? No. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> this month. There's some cricket happening this month that I'm intending to be there. That's about well, it. I'm off to South Africa, so um please be patient, England cricket on ninety nine point nine four listeners, because um I don't know when next we are gonna get together. It might be some point next week when our diaries align and that most importantly our time zones align because we're going to be oh 11 we'll, hours apart Rory. we'll talk England's warm up game in uh, we'll talk England's warm up match in, in Hamilton and see what we've learned from that oh, but both in the southern hemisphere at the same time anyway thank you for listening to England Cricket on 99.94 where we speak cricket every day please rate, review, subscribe wherever you enjoy your podcasts you can download the 99.94 app and follow us on Twitter at Norcross Cricket in my case and for you Rory at the RVD. I'll see you there. At the RVD. It's always, it's, you're starting to turn a little bit into a northern um, Phil Mitchell from EastEnders. Oh, Jesus Christ. At the RVD. Pick up next time. <laughs> Never miss out. Join our 24 7 conversation on social media. Follow us at 9994 DM Cricket. Every day, your way. <laughs>